has finished a book about Xerxes, and uh, what I'm going to do is say a little bit about uh, Xerxes in general and introduce a few paragraphs from the chapter of my book which is about the religion of Xerxes. So there's a, there's a slightly more technical content to this as well as the, the holiday snaps. <coughs> Xerxes is most famous for being defeated by the Greeks in the Battle of Salamis in 480 BC and has gone down in history as uh, a pretty bad thing one way and another and a lot of that I think was due to Alexander's propaganda who set him up as the exact polar opposite of everything that Alexander was, everything that Alexander did well, that he did badly and when he got to uh, Persepolis he seems to have concentrated on burning down Xerxes' palace as above everything else. Here is a portrait of, of Xerxes. Um, it's not a very good portrait and of course you can't uh, um, really tell one Persian king from another anyway. There's another, another view of him with his, with his attendants and uh, his, uh, his umbrella. Um, you can just about not so much on this stone, but on some of the others you can see very well the marks of the fire damage the resulting from Alexander's uh, huge fire at Persepolis. Here is one of the uh, inscriptions that Xerxes set up um, to uh, proclaim his, uh, his rule in, in Iran. This is at a place called Ganjnana, outside, uh, outside uh, Hamadan. Um, and uh, this is the, the inscription is in Old Persian, Elamite, and Babylonian. The Old Persian is on, on the left and uh, takes a bit more room than the other two. Um, here is a view of Persepolis from, from high up. This <coughs> bit here is the palace of Xerxes, that's the palace of Darius. And this is the hundred column hall here, and rather out under, under the awning is the Ahadana, the great audience hall. Um, so this is the, this is the, uh, the palace of Xerxes. Here's another view of it as the, as the sun goes down and the lights come on. I put this in because it is a very interesting uh, relief which is now in the Tehran Museum. It's known as the Treasury Relief. It originally stood, where are we? It, it originally stood there at the foot of the staircase in the Apadana, which you see there, but it was moved at some time in antiquity oops, <coughs> to the treasury, which is another part of the site of Pestis, and then was found there, or two, two, two versions of it, two mirror images were found there, and, and one of them is now in the museum in Tehran. Who is represented? Uh, as I pointed out, all Persian kings look much the same. Um, it's quite likely that the figure in the centre, seated here, is, is Xerxes. And uh, you can't see him very well in this photograph, but uh, we'll have another photograph later on of the person making a bear since before him. And the figure standing behind Xerxes should then be his son, uh, um, Artaxerxes or, or his son Darius. And the alternative is that this represents Darius, his, Xerxes' his father, and that this is Xerxes as crown prince, or it could be Darius and his elder son Achaemenes, who didn't come to the throne because Xerxes was the one who was born in the purple, as it were. Uh, and there are all kinds of theories about why this, uh, why this, uh, this relief might have been moved. Was it Xerxes who uh, moved it uh, because he didn't like being just crown prince anymore and he replaced it with that rather dull relief of some soldiers or was it Artaxerxes who removed it after Xerxes' assassination um, because he didn't like to uh, have uh, Xerxes on show anymore. Well we're not, uh, we're not going to solve that one but it's uh, typical of the kind of problems that face you. Here is the, uh, the uh, Chamberlain, or whoever it may be, making a bear, so it's covering his mouth with his hands to prevent his breath polluting the, uh, <coughs> the king as he speaks and to uh, uh, incense burners in front of him. Um, that's another way of paying a bear since to, uh, to the king. And there's the mirror image of the, uh, the relief, which is still in situ in, in Persepolis. That's the, one of the inscriptions that Xerxes put up, describing 
all the work he did at Persepolis. Again, this is the old Persian version. Um, right, um, explain the tree in a moment. I'm going to now read a short portion from chapter 5. I think it might be chapter 7 by now. Okay. The religion of the Achaemenid kings is controversial. Their tombs are adorned with the same figure of a bearded male in flight on a winged disc, um, as is um, on modern Zoroastrian fire temples. But were they Zoroastrians in the modern sense? The question is bound up with the date of the prophet Zoroaster, about which scholars have held and continue to hold widely differing opinions. No one now uh, thinks he's a, purely a figure of legend, but his, his date has been uh, moved over several millennia from the date of 6,000 years before Plato, which uh, Plato went for and nobody else thinks is very serious. Um, but among more rational opinions, one extreme is represented by Mary Boyce, who places the career of the prophet earlier in the second millennium <coughs> BC, a period which begins in the Stone Age, a view rejected as wildly improbable by Heidegger Koch. Gerardo Newley offers a less extreme view, placing him around 1000 BC on the basis of the archaic quality of the language of the Gathers, perhaps the only religious text that can be attributed to Zoroaster himself. Uh, earlier dates are also favoured. Warwick Wall puts him a bit later, before 800. <coughs> Zoroastrian tradition, however, is clear in the opinion that Zoroaster lived, quote, 258 years before Alexander. This date is given, for example, in the Adaviraf Namak, an account of a descent into hell by the eponymous Adaviraf, uh, and it also penetrated the Arabic chronicles. If Alexander is shorthand for Alexander's sack of Persepolis in 330 BC, that puts the prophet's floroit in 588 BC. If we assume that this was when he was around 40, and that his life lasted 77 years, as is also traditional, then his dates would be 628 to 551 BC. This would place Zoroaster firmly in the axial age that also ushered in the teaching of the Buddha, Confucius, and the pre-Socratic philosophers, the 6th and early 5th centuries BC. His ethical teaching transformed the character of Indo-Iranian polytheism into Masvian penotheism and introduced his regard for personal purity, which we don't find in any text of the Bronze Age. The impact of Zoroaster's arrival in Iran is evoked in Ferdowsi's Book of Kings, the Shahnameh, which was completed in the year 1010. The year he died. <coughs> Gushtasp, his Daspis, had not long been enthroned in Balk when the prophet appeared, and I quote now a little passage from the Warner's verse translation of Ferdowsi. Thus passed a while, and then a tree appeared, there's the tree, on earth within the palace of Gushtas, and grew up to the roof, a tree whose roots spread far and wide, a tree with many branches, its leafage precept, and its fruited wisdom. How shall one die who eat it of such fruit? A tree right fortunate, and named Zardusht, Zoroaster, the slayer of malignant Afriman. <clears throat> He brought a censer filled with fire and said, This have I brought with me from paradise. The maker of the world said, Take thou this and look upon the heaven and the earth, because I made them not of dust and water. Behold herein how I created them. Receive his good religion from the speaker and learn from him his usage and the way. See that thou do as he directeth thee. Choose wisdom. Recognize this world as vile and learn the system of the good religion, for kingship is not well when faith is lacking. This is not that tree. This, this, uh, <laughs> the tree was felled by the Muslim ruler al Muqtadil in 861. It was sliced into logs and brought into Baghdad, though the people of Persepolis offered 50,000 gold pieces to save it. However, the caliph was murdered the day after the logs' arrival. So that shows him. <laughs> this information from the 17th century Dabistan also states that the tree was planted 1450 years earlier, i.e. in 589 BC, a neat coincidence with the regular tradition on the dating of Zoroaster's arrival 250 years before Alexander. Well, this is not that the tree at Persepolis, but it is said to have been planted by Zoroaster. It's one of a number of 
cypress trees. This is the largest cypress tree in Iran, and you make a special trip to go and see it in a town called Abarku. Um, and it is indeed a rather magnificent tree, and tea is then served underneath the tree, of course. Um, the importance of the cypress tree as a symbol in Iranian art and culture is apparent on this uh, rug, and also on this copy of the, the, the principles of the Zoroastrian religion, Asal, uh, Asal Adin is our Pushd, um, which we saw in the fire temple in, uh, in Yazd. So, um, tradition makes uh, Darius a Zoroastrian, but there are problems with the attribution of Zoroastrianism to the Persian kings. <coughs> Mary Boyce believed that all the Achaemenid kings from Cyrus the Great onwards were Zoroastrians in more or less the modern sense, which of course depends on dating <coughs> Zoroaster pre Cyrus. Um, Albert de Jong has made a helpful distinction between three possible views of the history of Achaemenid religion. The fragmentizing approach, which supposes a number of different and mutually exclusive religions in Persia. The harmonizing approach, which allows for only one. Highly conservative and unchanging tradition of Zoroastrian belief and practice. And the diversity view, which allows for historical change and development in the religion. On this last view, the Gathas are not the origin of all Zoroastrian doctrine, and other gods can win and lose adherence over time within the overall dualist framework. The main arguments against the Zoroastrianism of Darius and Xerxes depend on taking the strong, harmonizing view of Zoroastrian history. First of all, there is little evidence of dualism in their inscriptions. They only talk about Aglora Mazda, the good god. They don't say anything about the evil god uh, so important in Zoroastrianism, Ahriman. Um, the second and most obvious difference, I'm going to skip forward and then come back, um, from modern Zoroastrianism, Zoroastrianism is that there is no evidence for the exposure of the dead. Um, this is a tower of silence outside Yazd, where um, until earlier in this, in, well, until sometime in the 20th century, it was customary for Zoroastrians to expose their dead on the tower, on the top of the tower, um, to be consumed by, by the birds of the air, so that the dead will not pollute any of the elements of earth or fire or water, which would be the case if they, buried, if they disposed of the dead in any other way. And you can see it's a fairly extensive circular area uh, the dead are laid out on this uh, circle of stones here, and then when, when they have been excarnated, as the word is, by the birds, the bones are shoveled together and put into this deeper pit right in the middle. So there's no evidence at all for that in, uh, in um, the reigns of Darius and Xerxes. Um, um, We don't know whether the kings were simply buried in the tombs which, uh, which they have at, uh, at Nakhchivostan, or whether they were excarnated or disposed of in some other way first. It's perfectly possible that the tombs were in fact just ossuaries, the bones were placed there after the excarnation. Thirdly, no, no, uh, no uh, unsecurely <coughs> identified fire temples have been found prior to the Parthian period. What seem to be fire altars, however, yeah. are frequently represented on the tombs of Darius and later kings. This is the tomb of, um, uh, yeah, that's, this is the tomb of Xerxes. Um, you can't see the fire altar very well, so there, there's the king. But this is a bit more visible on this, uh, on this tomb of Darius, which is slightly better preserved. Um, so, Fire altars are represented on the tombs, and there is there is a figure who is either a Hura Mazda or the the royal fortune, the king's royal fortune. There it is again. That's not this. There it is. Um, the gold plaques from the Oxus treasure, a trove of gold objects from the Achaemenid period, depict figures who seem to be Zoroastrian priests. Sometimes with masked faces, he's not actually masked, but he's wearing a kind of hood, not like the actual face mask that a modern Zoroastrian priest wears. And he's now holding the bundle of sticks, which is known as a bar song. And there are similar figures also on the 
reliefs at Persepolis. Um, so I am inclined to think that Xerxes was, in the technical sense, a Zoroastrian. Um, but was he, as has often been suggested, a king with a mission to establish Zoroastrianism to the exclusion of all other religions? <coughs> One of the only inscriptions states, there it is, it's in the uh, Oriental Institute in Chicago, among these countries there was a place where previously false gods were worshipped. Afterwards, by the favour of Ahura Mazda, I destroyed that sanctuary of the demons, and I made proclamation, the demons shall not be worshipped. Where previously the demons were worshipped, there I worshipped Ahura Mazda and Atta, or Justice. Um, and you could recall that even in the 1970s, the Shah of Iran believed that he had a divine mission, that God was on his side, uh, messages from God had helped him to save his country. Maybe the US president thought the same. Um, However, the most recent view of this, uh, of this controversy is that this is not a statement about exclusive Zoroastrianism and about the destruction of the temples in Athens, for example, and Babylon, because they were not Zoroastrian temples. It's not a personal statement, simply a statement of religious orthodoxy. The worship of a Pura Mazda is a metaphor for loyalty to the king, and as a corollary, Daeva worship, demon worship, is a metonym for rebellion. Um, Xerxes has improved these places by performing Zoroastrian rituals in them, but he is not being exclusive. It's nonetheless a forceful statement of the religious underpinning of Persian rule. Well, that's really what I wanted to, the argument I wanted to present. I have a couple more pictures to show you, just because I thought everybody would like to see one or two of the tribute bearers from Persepolis. Um, this is one of the ones that uh, photographs rather rather better. It's a beautiful uh, gold, uh, presumably gold uh, jug that he is carrying. And uh, here is one of the most striking sculptures of the, the lion attacking the bull, which has been interpreted quite interestingly um, in terms of the No Ruse festival, the New Year festival. Again, we don't know whether <coughs> with the ancient Persian kings actually celebrated no ruse, but it is the moment when the, uh, the lion enters the constellation of Taurus, the bull, and it, uh, it has been suggested quite intriguingly that this symbol may have something to do with the arrival of the new year. Okay. Um, at this point I just want to say a warm thank you to uh, Travel the Unknown, who organised our tour, and I'm very pleased that David McGuinness, who is in charge of Travel the Unknown, is with us and is recording us at this very moment. In fact, he has brought brochures and so on for you to see. Um, it's, uh, we had a, a wonderful time, thanks to them, and uh, thanks also to our uh, redoubtable uh, tour leader, um, who combined a Sassanian physique with an Achaemenid profile. <laughs> um, and uh, people have, uh, I've shown some of these photos to people and they've expressed surprise that the women are not more wrapped up than, uh, than they are. So I just wanted to make it clear that if you do decide to go to Iran, the wrapping up is not as bad as it might seem. And you can get away with uh, wearing your sunglasses on the top of your head, your scarf pushed right back, and your feminine curves, as they call them, extremely visible. Um, this. Uh, <laughs> This does um, bring me to a concluding remark about Xerxes, who, as you all remember, um, was assassinated not long after he'd made the faux pas of falling for a much younger woman. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't bring her home, so it's all right. <laughs> um, but, uh, um, the younger woman that he fell for was not only his niece but also his son's wife, so there were quite a lot of reasons why his son Darius might not have been too keen on the <laughs> arrangement. But um, it's much better when, uh, um, when you are a king to preserve a properly philosophical attitude in the face of eternity, as did our next speaker. Basically, <laughs> 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 Over to you. <laughs>